Welcome back to episode number four in our Making Sense of Web3 and Crypto series uh, with myself, Rufus Pollock, and my uh, co-host of this section, Stephen Deal. Uh, this week, we're going to start diving into the more utopian visions of crypto and Web3. Unlike in the previous dialogues where we discussed positions that were largely either monetary or uh, about monetary or financial reconfiguration, you know, reinstating the gold standard or even just getting rich quick, this time we'll start engaging with viewpoints uh, and people who really have a set of political imaginaries about making the world a better place as they see it. Before we do that, just a little bit of context on this series, if you're new or to remind you, if you've listened before, this is part of an in-depth exploration of crypto and Web3, and you can follow it at lifeitself.us slash Web3. Web3 has become a massive phenomenon with very bold claims made about its potential impact, and the claims that go far beyond classic technology boosterism to claims of radical transformation, improvement of our economic and social systems. At the same time, there is an exceptional lack of... Uh, agreement or exceptional level of disagreement about these claims, even on basic points and definitions. And overall, this is a very controversial and polarizing topic with strong pro and anti camps. We, this series is about helping people maybe make both make sense of what is going on and to evaluate clean claims. And in the process, bring us maybe to some degree together uh, to a shared collective sense making about what's happening and what we should do. We're starting by exploring specific hopes and aspirations and their associated ideologies, like the one we'll talk about today. One final point for listeners is that throughout the series, we are seeking to steel man the various positions. That is, we're putting forward the best version of any given viewpoint, whether we agree with it or not, in the hopes of giving it the, both as a demonstration of the kind of spirit in which we were engaged in the enterprise, but also so we have a robust uh, sort of ground for discussion when we then come to critique that position. Okay, so back to this week, as we say, we're looking at the more utopian visions of crypto and Web3, and specifically, we're going to engage with the imaginaries laid out by technologists and venture capitalists, primarily. And it's a vision that allegedly aims to transition the world from the existing US-led international order to a vision in which blockchain technology and technology technocracy are the new foundations for global human governments that's fairer and freer. This thesis has been put forward in various forms. So far, at least uh, Stephen and based on Stephen and my research, the most fully articulated version that we have found is from Balaji Srinivasan. Uh, and we're gonna link in the show notes to the background source material, and we welcome suggestions uh, for other material that we should look at in this area, since you know, we don't know, we certainly don't know everything, and we're constantly seeking for improvements uh, in the evidence base. Now, I want to start coming to you now, Stephen, and just ask you, what is the, let's, we're going to start here by steel manning or setting up the best version of this thesis as we've understood it from our reading, and as we understand it from just our own context in, uh, in politics, science, you know, technology and economics and so on. Do you want to set, set up the kind of core of this thesis for us uh, in its best version? Yeah, so this is the first time we're actually going to dive into what a lot of the folks in Silicon Valley think about crypto and sort of the political imaginaries they have about how this technology kind of make the world a better place and how it can kind of reconfigure the world's power structures in ways that they feel are more ideal. And the essence of this ideology, I think, stems back to a rather older idea that's been around since the early days of the internet, which is this overarching conception of the, the, the self-sovereignty of cyberspace. Um, and this ideology postulates kind of an extension of that, um, which in their words, creates this thing called a network state. And a network state, under their definition, is a social network with an agreed upon leader, an integrated cryptocurrency, a definite purpose, a sense of national consciousness and a plan to crowdfund physical territory. Um, so this is an extension of a kind of long running trend in sort of libertarian thought by which people believe that they should create independent states or independent jurisdictions in which 
the ideals of libertarianism can finally be fully realized because outside of the rest of the world, libertarianism is part of more of a fringe sort of ideology. It doesn't have a kind of mainstream acceptance. And so the idea is like we can create island nations or we can create city states or we can do seasteading or do what um, these folks call network state. And that's the essence of this ideology, this network state. Okay, and just to say, obviously, we're mentioning here, perhaps oddly, because libertarianism is sort of the utopianism of our time, but this vision of being able to create uh, kind of innovative, state-like communities, I mean, the 19th century, they'd have probably been uh, socialists, so maybe even today they are the left wing, I think of the Fourierists in 19th century America or the others. But okay, so the key point is uh, the self-sovereignty of cyberspace, uh, a network state, and you mentioned, I think we, maybe people, listeners will remember or know of John Perry Barlow's A Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace from the 1990s, oddly actually written at the World Economic Forum, I believe, by John Perry Barlow. Uh, and then there's Peter Thiel, uh, who again, a very well-known venture capitalist, who's also uh, in that direction, the, where there's, I think, somehow a connection with a, uh, a view about the economic and social progress of mankind you sort of hit a wall at least in the physical world uh maybe a wall in terms of our innovation or our capacity to innovate or grow but maybe also that's a social wall or a, a kind of a governance wall as well so why do they why do why do people want to uh, build a network state what and what are what are the what are the actual key aspects of a network state Stephen? yeah i think you have to understand the kind of Peter Thiel ideology. And there's a lot of um, sort of ideations that happen around that man because he's very influential in Silicon Valley. Uh, but I think his general thesis is that we've kind of hit a wall on physical progress and that there's a lot of things that we could be doing in technology and progress that we're currently not able to do um, because of existing kind of regulatory structures or because of like self-censorship or because of sort of taboos in research at the moment. And so the network state as envisioned by the crypto folks, at least in the documentation and literature they write, is primarily in their own words, to do biomedical research and human genetic experiments that are prohibited in other countries. So basically the idea is that like inside of this independent city state, we could do things that the rest of the world won't let us do. And that these things are actually good because they allow us to advance the frontiers of human knowledge and be able to do experiments and research that is otherwise prohibited. Uh, and they think that basically the only way to affect this kind of change is to basically uh, create independent jurisdictions where these things are allowed. Okay, I, the, the, I mean, just to put it also in the best part of it, there's also just, a, that's just one example, perhaps one that might touch pe people's hackles. I mean, it might mean even here self-experimentation, people are allowed to try things out just as, you know, one, just to take a more positive example, during the AIDS epidemic, I understand at the beginning, there were many drugs that weren't kind of FDA approved and people wanted, you know, pe people who were dying of HIV AIDS wanted to try out, you know, new drugs th that weren't yet approved on themselves. You know, they wanted just to try anything. But there's also a part of just like, there's both the kind of, whether it might be in biomedical research, but also just trying things out, maybe different forms of voting. Maybe you want to stay where not everyone gets equal votes and, you know, one person, one vote or whatever, but just a space of innovation, essentially. That's the, the motivation. And the question I'm going to have, obviously, we can talk a little bit about the nation, nurture states, but there's also some connection here to crypto. Like what, why, I mean, people have these utopian dreams, you said since the beginning of the internet, but they're kind of reinvigorated in this crypto web three era. Is that right? Yeah. So I think cryptocurrencies are just one aspect of what these people see as kind of a, a new frontier of advances that could possibly exist. And you're right. There could be experiments and things like governance, but I think the kind of the overarching technologies that they want to experiment with in these kind of new civilizations or cryptocurrency, seasteading, transhumanism, space travel, life extension, um, and just new governance models. Uh, and so these are all things that are, you know, uh, avant-garde topics in technology in the Valley. And they feel like, you know, we need to create a new state in order to kind of foster sort of rapid and, you know, exponential developments of these technologies. And that by creating the state, we'll be able to do things that we can't do elsewhere. I think this brings us to a point. There's a motivation for having the states, but crypto is both 
something you could have inside these states, but is also maybe a crucial and, as I understand it, crucial enabling technology. It provides, and well, let's come to that. I mean, let's come to this question. What? Let's do a bit of background theory on the nature of the state and the reason for the existence of the state. Because this is a classic problem in political science and philosophy, right? Yeah. So, like, throughout all of the discourse in philosophy and political science, there's been questions about, like, where does the justification for, like, the sovereignty of the state actually come from? And there's a bunch of schools of thought, depending on kind of which which school you subscribe to. I mean, the oldest one probably comes from uh, Thomas Hobbes, who argued that the absolute power of the sovereign was ultimately justified by the consent of the governed, who agreed in a hypothetical social contract to obey the sovereign in all matters in exchange for a guarantee of peace and security. So this is kind of a commonly cited rationale for liberal democracy, that the, the state exists by the consent of the governed, right? Um, and you have sort of other thinkers that kind of have different kind of perspectives. Hurricane Habermas argues that like the modern state plays a large role in structuring the economy by regulating economic activity and being a large scale economic consumer and producer. Uh, and it's uh, through its redistributed welfare state activities that it changes legitimacy by basically creating a circular economy that exchanges goods and services and by providing kind of baseline welfare for the public. This is what gives rise to the legitimacy of the state. And then you have this kind of more libertarian sort of perspective on these things, which they say that like the state is ultimately forged from fire out of conflict and its legitimacy is based on conquest and the subsequent monopoly on violence, that the state basically has this kind of um, violence in is frozen and that's the state. Um, and that basically the individuals in perpetual conflict with the state and that basically things like taxation are not all that distinct from like basically like a protection racket like the mob will do. And so like uh, basically the individuals in perpetual conflict with the state. And this is very popular in sort of ultra right wing kind of libertarian circles, but it's one that has a fairly sizable following uh, at least in America. And so these are all kind of the classical kind of justifications for why states can exist. But the kind of overarching thing and how this fits into the, the network state thing is that there are different schools um, and there's no a priori reason to assume any one of these models. One could postulate a different rationale for the existence of a network state. And perhaps the kind of crypto network state does have a rationale that could exist. So that's kind of what we're gonna kind of explore throughout this, this whole uh, narrative. So just to say, and again, it's funny, I always call it the horseshoe on both the left and the right, because libertarianism sometimes assumes as right. I mean, on the anarchists have a very similar view of that last point of the state as sort of this oppressive agency. It, it was like the mafia that sort of just became state size um, to some extent. So the, th the thing in the nation state argument, just to set it out for listeners, is what one can then sort of do is ask yourself, whatever of these views you subscribe to, what does a traditional state do? What are its functions? And could those be replaced? How would they get replaced in a network state? How would we create a different state that took on those functions? Or even more strongly as a thesis, they are being dissolved, whether you want them dissolved or not. They just, the, the march forward of the, you know, uh, digital technology, you know, the network society is going to dissolve the traditional role of the state. So sort of what in the steel man argument, you're going to go through each of the kind of functions of the state. So that might be, you know, physical protection, uh, pro you know, pr protection or enforcement of private of property rights, uh, administering of justice, uh, funding of research and development. And we could just go through the things a state might do and be like, okay, that's going to get, re that is getting replaced or it could get replaced by the network state. So let's pick the first one of those in this kind of the steel man version. We're arguing the best version as we can. Let's, what's the first one of these that we're going to look at? Yeah. So we're actually drawing this directly from the source material about the, there's a foreign policy article um, that's about um, the kind of, the idealized form of the network state and the functions of the traditional nation state that it aims to replace. And the kind of first kind of role of a nation state is that it's a physical access to other people. Uh, it's basically a land territory that has a border, it's enforced and normally citizens can pass through that border and non-citizens can come under, you know, some sort of legal framework, right? Um, so the nation state enforces its borders and it grants citizenship. Right, and that gives you access to a collection of people, their resources, to jobs, to their economy, um, and that's 
been traditionally what sort of nation states have done in the past. Um, and there is a kind of grain of truth in the fact that a lot of these notions are becoming more fluid. Um, we see here in the European Union that there's kind of freedom of movement between different nation states that are independent, but they form a collective block. Notions like remote work um, and, you know, um, nomad visas are genuinely actually kind of making the boundaries between at least some nation states a lot more fluid. And citizenship um, for a lot of people that work in technology or work in you know, high skilled jobs is becoming a more fluid concept. I think most of us have kind of traveled, both you and I probably have traveled multiple jurisdictions in our lifetime. And this is just a reality. There's a kind of kernel of truth in this. Um, but what they do in this, this article is take this kind of to a much larger extent and say like, well, the borders themselves everywhere nationally are kind of being dissolved. Like this is an anachronism um, that citizenship and physical access to both people and to jobs is becoming something of the past. Okay, so that's kind of point one. Uh, so, you know, uh, then there's, and there's, there's things like the ability to transfer money and so on. Uh, so then what we, so that's one aspect of the state um and then I, what's another the next point that they come to is like this kind of the currency and this regulation is that right for example yeah so traditionally in any nation state there's usually been a central bank that issues the currency that goods or services are denominated in within that economy um and the circular demand for the currency is created by taxation um and this currency usually acts as a medium of exchange and the central bank kind of controls the money supply and that sustains the economy. So this has been a classical role of the state. This happens everywhere in America and Great Britain and France, pretty much everywhere at this point. Um, and this is, you know, the thesis is that, well, national currencies are no longer really necessary anymore because we have cryptocurrencies and uh, money is no longer being confined domestically anymore. It's kind of an international concept that the internet is the you know platform on which we live our lives now, which we conduct commerce, in which we kind of transact in our day-to-day -day work. You know, so why shouldn't the internet basically be the one that issues the currency at this point? Because it is becoming international, and there's a kernel of truth in that. And we've also seen that I just to emphasize, obviously outside of crypto, I mean, just to say for this thesis, it doesn't have. We, we want to emphasize the connection with crypto and Web three, but you know, there's transfer wise. There are many money services that money transfer services. That is clearly the flow of, of of money around the world, and even the creation of credit to some extent. You know, telecom providers in some sense create credit when they give you, uh, you know, airtime credit or something else or whatever. Uh, there are many other providers of people who sort of can generate money. So that's one aspect of the state. The other is regulation and property rights. Uh, so that's another area that they would, that you'd want to go through and say, okay, well, the state's traditionally done that. This network, we don't need that anymore. We can do it in the network state, in the net, on the internet or whatever. How does, how does that work? How, how do we replace regulation and, and uh, property rights or property rights enforcement, sorry? Yeah, so the first claim is that kind of um, traditional state-based regulators are being kind of replaced by cloud-based regulators. And so the example they cite is like Uber. So typically when you used to get a taxi service, you'd have to buy like a medallion or get a license from like the city in order to operate a taxi service. So they do like a background check on you and figure out if you could, you know, actually run the taxi service and know how to navigate the city and all that. Um, and so what they've done is said like, oh, well, Uber basically replaced the medallion service by basically, oh, we're just gonna attach a GPS to each of their drivers. And now they can track them in real time. And if anything goes wrong, then they can just intervene. And that this kind of self-regulatory framework within the private sector is actually more efficient than the public sector. Um, and then they extend this notion to say that, well, you know, typically the state has been responsible for enforcing things like property rights. So if somebody comes into your, your home and, and robs you, you know, the police will come and, you know, kind of defend you and like you know, basically you, they won't be able to seize your house or your property and that there's a recourse within the legal system and within kind of um, you know the policing system to basically guarantee the property rights of individuals and so their notion is that a lot more property is becoming digital now and so like the state's no longer necessary to enforce property rights because digital goods can be protected by cryptography of which case there's no amount of violence or force that's necessary to kind of secure it anymore. It's secured by math. Uh, and the property rights are becoming kind of an anachronism in this kind of new network state. 
And finally, there's a point of what states do. I mean, there's things like they provide social services and they also kind of in kind of connected with that, they redistribute wealth. They, they, they act as a means by which either they enforce or they, or they, uh, they act as a conduit by which people share if we put it in the most positive sense or the, the most negative, they, they force to be rich to be whatever way, that's another function of the state, social services and wealth kind of redistribution or social welfare. How is that going to get dissolved away or replaced in the network state? Yeah, so we legitimately see this happening at least with some public goods. So the kind of clearest example would be things like the Linux community and open source in general um, are all basically self-organizing um, volunteer funding of public goods in which people donate their time and their money to basically create things in the public sphere. Um, things like open source software, things like open source operating systems. And like, this has been working for a very long time. And even things like, you know, um, journalism or like public spaces now are all often becoming you know there's a public private partnership in which you know private individuals fund these things now um, and so the notion is that in these network states uh, we no longer require you know investments in things like you know the bell labs and the darpas of the world to kind of fund r d and research that you know we can do this within the, the private sphere and that we have a history of being able to do this at least with digital goods yes i mean it's just to say, we'll come to it in the critique, but we should emphasize that that's, that's a kind of a debated question. I mean, Lin Linus Torvalds was a paid for PhD student when he wrote Linux. He based it on a software that, again, was funded publicly. But we'll come back to that point. And there are obviously examples also about the persistence of kind of online distributed communities. At the moment, often, sometimes, um, you know, like the Pirate Bay, a file sharing site has existed since 2003 in some form or other, uh, despite government attempts to remove it. Uh, so people have successfully built these kind of anti-fragile services that exist outside the regulation perimeter and have endured uh, for some time and therefore kind of stood the test of time. And so where does this kind of lead us? So we've kind of gone through roughly, maybe briefly, these key uh, and when I say we've done it briefly, it's about the same make that it's gone through in these articles. Uh, it's not in a lot more depth, but these kind of different features of the state and see how they could maybe be dissolved or replaced in an internet world uh, or a, a pure kind of digital world. And where crypto, you've mentioned in one area of property rights, but crypto and Web3, other around governance, collaboration, are going to are going to be kind of crucial to how that happens. So what's the what's the actual yeah what's the next part of this thesis? Yeah, the overarching theme is that most of the traditional services of the state can be replaced by software, and that this is not only desirable; it's inevitable because we see this happening in many ways in which basically the things that you know we used to be provided for um, are being done increasingly by the private sector or are being online organizing communities or they're being done by kind of extra of anti-fragile services like cryptocurrency sort of global international um, services for a community of people that kind of need to exist outside of sort of tr the traditional regulatory framework and there's some precedent that we can actually build these things reliably and so the overarching theme of this is that basically not only is this possible not only is it desirable that it's inevitable that the state's going to be dissolved because we can do everything the state does better. And so simply put, the 21st century doesn't belong, and this is a quote, doesn't belong to China, the United States, or Silicon Valley. It belongs to the internet. And you can also see here uh, the attractiveness of this thesis. It's a, it's a very good soundbitey thesis. Uh, it's provocative, it's exciting. Uh, and there's, there's real grains, as we've emphasized here, we want to emphasize again, there's some really substantial grains of truth to a whole bunch of this. Um, even this very cool right now takes a place across jurisdictions. That was something impossible, uh, certainly a century ago, I mean, you know, and, and even 20, 30 years ago in the quality that we're having it. Um, so nation states and so on are being dissolved from within. The internet is global. The internet is the basis of human life. It's borders, borders should not exist in cyberspace. And citizenship in the traditional sense of citizenship of a territorial state is an anachronism. Instead, we're going to be a member of a DAO or DAOs or something like that. Um, there's no border politics, uh, is you know, and it's a 
it's a divergence from traditional right-wing positions. Uh, it actually resonates with left-wing positions. And this is an interesting kind of shift of thinking. It's like I said at the horseshoe, uh, left and right sort of converge. There are, there are no borders. Uh, there's just, there's just the, the freedom, uh, the freedom of cyberspace, um, which is a new, a new land, a new frontier. Um, you know, it's almost a synthesis of ideas. I think you and I, were to, you know, said of Chomsky and anarchism and neo-reactionary thought. Uh, it's like kind of Burning Man techno anarchism, but at a nation-state scale. Uh, and that's kind of really, I think, if anyone who's been to Burning Man or knows people, it is also very exciting in a very positive sense. There's a sense of possibility of an excitement that's been missing for far too long from our politics. A sense of, yeah, we can do things differently, and and we can experiment. We're not stuck with these small upgrades to kind of liberal capitalism, you know, the iPhone X whatever, which is a slightly bigger screen, uh, a slightly nicer camera. There's something radically new and exciting coming. Um, and the, the supposition here as I said, is the state can and should be hollowed out, or at least the traditional state. Uh, we can replace all of these legacy functions. Uh, and we love that term legacy, so common in software, these legacy functions with software. Uh, the public goods that once supported it can be replaced by either the private sector or blockchain based DAOs. Uh, we don't need the state anymore in this way. Uh, we can replace the, the DMV and the tax authority with automation and replacing, replacing it with the private sector maybe is more controversial, but it certainly seems at least more efficient. I think the bigger question mark here, and just to emphasize it's such a big topic, we'll probably explore in future episodes is how do you replace public goods? It's one thing to think that you can, that you know, Google might build a better DMV for renewing your driving license. It's a different thing to think that Google or whoever else or some even distributed collaborative down might do our run run our military or for that matter run pay for all of our r d uh, or sort out climate global climate negotiations so that issue of the public goods and large-scale collective coordination is a little bit vaguer in these stories but is often part of the narrative around DAOs and web3 and something we will come back and explore more so for now we're just going to take that kind of on take it on trust. We can imagine those things are happening. And what's the, the other part of the critique, which again has a lot of substance to it, is the other side of it, not just what's possible, but what's wrong. Modern nation states are simply too big or, or too small. They are either, you know, they're either too bureaucratic and sclerotic and inefficient, or they're too small to really deal with the scale of problems that we have, like climate change or regulating AI or whatever. Say more about this point, you know, people, what's the problem with the station state today? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just, you know, the notion is that like all politics is local. And I think people just reason about their personal lives um, and, you know, their beliefs, the kind of a Dunbar's number, which is basically the kind of um, physiological number of friends and community you can actually have supported by like the human cognitive I think it's like 120 or something of that order, right? And so this kind of seems to be kind of a universal number across a lot of uh, different cultures across the world. And legitimately, there's a strong case to be made that like um, Western sort of big, large, um, slow liberal democracies are kind of pathological in history. There's a really great thinker called Joseph uh, Henrik who's made a very strong case that kind of high trust Western cultures are actually kind of the exception rather than the norm throughout history. And that we may actually be kind of living in kind of a rather pathological and one might say like unnatural state of being, um, albeit one that has sort of very, very interesting high growth properties, but one that's not necessarily historically supported by stability. We may be kind of living in what's called like a metastable state that's not actually stable. Um, and so people want to experiment. They want to say maybe a more optimal form of human self-organization actually actually exist and it's somewhere between sort of your large European Union kind of organization and like you know the nations or the city states of like ancient Greece right where there was a very small cloister of people that mostly engaged in like agriculture and so maybe something some middle way exists and so people look at like ideals of like uh, the cap authoritarian capitalist city states of like Singapore as being kind of like bastions of potential new ways of being and new ways of self-organizing. And so a lot of the crypto kind of um, nation state building kind of focuses on like the ideal of Singapore, 
as being kind of a really great exemplar of like what could be. And we see this kind of manifest not just in their political imaginaries, but in their actual um, endeavors. People are trying to create these kind of blockchain friendly hubs across the world, places like El Salvador, in Singapore, in the canton of Zug. And the notion is that these cities can actually be purchased using crowdfunding, which is exactly what they're talking about, um, to basically you know, give blockchain technology and their technology solutions kind of the rights of sovereign states and that we can create these kind of you know, techno utopian communities, which will attack top talent and attract people who are looking for low taxes, business opportunities, and sort of like-minded crypto people to form new communities and new ways of being. Well, I mean, it sounds, yeah, as you say, I mean, that we're looking for a more optimal form of human self-organization somewhere between a tribe and a modern nation state. And this is like a really, just to emphasize, a really powerful aspiration or, or inquiry to have. It's a really good inquiry to have. Can, can we do better than what we have? And in particular, there, there's a kernel of truth. I mean, I mean there's, there's something really true in the, or something really valuable in the aspiration. And there's something really true in the critique. I mean, Western democracies are in many ways slow and sclerotic. The public trust in institutions is at an all-time low. Uh, Americans legitimately uh, elect an imbecile, basically, to control their nuclear arsenal. arsenal. Things are clearly not working optimally in democracy at the moment. Um, I mean, ultimately, there's an infinite supply of whataboutisms if you want to talk about the genuine deficiencies in American hegemony and the rules-based international or order. Uh, so there's something kind of really exciting about this. And there's some also, again, some real really significant grains of truth in the critique or more than grains of truth real lumps of gold there uh, and you know so the question of course is uh you know what does this look like is it is it crypto you know it's the smartest people in the world exiting into their own economy uh it as again a quote um problems like climate change show that the liberal democracies and the existing international order are highly vulnerable to paralysis on global tragedy of the commons problems to be fair, that was also true of tribal societies, you know, and early city states several thousand years ago that also messed up their ecosystems uh, or hunted woolly mammoth to extinction. But it really shows something is really deeply problematic right now. We, we, we face what well, maybe not extinction events, but certainly really, really severe consequences uh, of our failure to look after the global commons or to steward it well. And just like in evolution, maybe corruption is this kind of natural state of being. We need uh, to embrace the corruption uh, rather than live up to the ideals of liberal democracy. I mean, this is more than maybe almost realist version. You know, you can go either with the idealist version, we're corrupted by this thing, or to say, look, we're just, liberal democracy isn't realistic, not at the scale we need. We need something different. Uh, instead of a strong man to save us, we need strong tech. We need a different uh, setup. And to finish this, I think this very, this very exciting, at least, and it's again, this mixture of something which we all aspire to, but then how is it realized? Web3 is the paradigm shift akin to the industrial revolution we've been waiting for, uh, or Web3 plus all of the digital technology, computers, the internet, and so on we've had already. But this is the mm -hmm. moment it really comes to fruition with a governmental structure and so on. Uh, our current readings of economics are incommensurate with the inevitable new world order that will exist after blockchain and tokenization take over. Uh, we can't stop this runaway phenomenon. We simply have to embrace it. And this, by the way, is one way to go, you know, rather just even be good. It's going to happen whether you like it or not. We have, you didn't like the Industrial Revolution, you know, but so what? The Industrial Revolution happened. We need to embrace it. Uh, crypto is inevitable. We can't put the toothpaste back in the tube, whether even if we wanted to, and maybe it's a really good thing. And creative destruction is unpredictable, but in the end, it's going to be right. And historical inventions like the printing press were fraught with concern and risk. And yet humanity survived those paradigm shifts. And this disruption is no different. The train of progress only goes in one direction. Let's get on it or get on it or get run over, basically. There's no place for the Luddites in the future. And I think there's kind of two versions. This is the more like you have, whether you like it or not. And there's also a version which is, this is this chance to build the new order that we've been waiting for. So as you can hear, I think that that's, it's just, it, it's kind of almost intoxicating. And I think of it sometimes, you know, there's a, as we switch down maybe to come to a critique, I want to say something a preliminary before that, that I hope listeners won't take, will, will take it away. Because we'll be trying to think of analogies, which is, and we're not saying this is correct, 
because it's a loaded analogy. But when you think of something, let's say like Marxism in the early 19th century, or even you look at Marx's critique of capitalism today, you just say, wow, there was a lot that was right there. There was a lot of really valid critique. Marx was a brilliant thinker, a Brit certainly a Brit brilliant critic. Uh, there was this incredible inequality gaps. There was this alienation. There was this radical disruption of people's lives. There were these contradictions, it seemed, of capitalism, of what it, you know, of its exploitation with its growth and so on. Um, and there was, so, that, so to put it simply, there were a lot of nuggets of gold or grains of, of, of truth, a, a, kind of, or nuggets of truth in that critique. And yet the actual, um, where that necessarily led us at least a lot of the ways Marxism ended up going weren't actually so good. Even probably for the proponents of much of Marxism, it often became undemocratic, it became oppressive. Um, it, a lot of the critique just about what was going to happen to capitalism ultimately turned out to be mistaken, um, etc. And I think this is a useful, not that we're saying in any way that uh, Web3 uh, crypto or something, but to kind of... the. the we're very, at least I personally, you know, Stephen can speak to himself, extremely interested in what I would call pragmatic utopianism or rigorous idealism. How can we build radically wiser worlds than we have today uh, and do that, though, in a pragmatic, rigorous, realistic way? But And you have to be very cautious there. How do you avoid, you know, particularly when there's these kind of gaps between the critique has substance, but then there's these, well, like Marx, it's just somehow we're all going to live in it. Once we've got rid of private property, we're all just going to like, you know, love each other kind of thing. And it's all just going to be, no ex exploitation will magically disappear. That's what's crucial to examine in these kind of utopian narratives. How exactly will it happen? And how do we avoid the, the risk that always exists that such things go wrong? that they turn into, they give us the, in fact, maybe even not the opposite, but something worse. They give us authoritarianism rather than liberation. They give us uh, a different kind of inequality. Uh, they stunt our creativity and capacity for innovation and, uh, you know, uh, freedom, free thought rather than empowering it. So that's what we're going to do when you turn to the critique now. And so do you want to start, Stephen? What's, what do you think, yeah, where do you want to start out here in, look, in examining this this bold vision that we've just set out? I think that's a really salient point because just like with Marxism, um, you can very accurately analyze the problems of something and give a very kind of you know incisive and kind of critical critique of something where you kind of actually identify the flaws in the system. And then suppose something that's kind of completely a non-solution. And I think I would consider myself in the kind of, I regard kind of Marxism as being kind of a, a very, you know, um, incisive critique of capitalism. And I don't think some of the, the latter half of the proposed solutions have historically kind of worked out that well. And so perhaps um, with all of this crypto and blockchain stuff, maybe their analysis of the problems of the current financial system may be actually correct. And I think actually a lot of them are because they, um, they've, thought very deeply about like what the problems in the current financial system are. And so like we should in good faith kind of look at what they identify as the problems because there may be actually a profound truth there that we can kind of take into a more pragmatic utopianism rather than kind of a more of a Marxist kind of vision. And so when we go into the critique, I think it's kind of important to start on the foundation that this is an extension of sort of libertarian thought. And I think this particular flavor of that is a philosophy that's really built on like a disdain for kind of top-down command and control structures. It's basically a conception that a classless and hierarchy free world is actually possible and that we can actually build it. And that this is desirable because at the root of sort of the psychological underpinnings of like libertarianism is that people want to be left alone. They don't want to be told what to do. Uh, they want the what they call liberty to exist in the way they want to exist. And those are all universal things. Um, and I think the only kind of just divergence is people want this applied at the level of like civilization. And that's kind of the underpinning of libertarian thought. And I think the other key point is that the entire argument that they're proposing um, is what I would call predicated upon future tech. Um, it's predicated upon things that don't exist currently, um, but they claim perhaps at some point might exist in the future. And an accurate um, critique is that it is possible to falsely treat 
technical reality or technical possibility as being an inevitability. And as of yet in the technology today, the claims like cryptocurrencies can act as like algorithmic central banks and have the capacity to kind of service national currencies seems unsubstantiated by the evidence we see in the world today. So nobody's pretty much nobody's actually denominating goods or services uh, in cryptocurrencies uh, because largely there's large economic problems with the volatility of these things that make kind of running an economy on one of these things completely unviable at the moment. To the extent that people are using um, like things like stable coins, which are have a stable value, they only have a stable value derived from the fact that they are pegged to another nation state's currency, right? So the notion that we could create a kind of fully algorithmic central bank remains in the realm of science fiction at the moment. Um, it may be possible, but there may become very deep economic problems with this. And I think this really kind of goes to the notion that like, you know, throughout history, we've seen different technologies that have advanced um, the state of where we as humans can communicate and transact. So things like, you know, in the 1700s, nothing actually moved faster than like a horse. Right, literally, no, nothing that humans did could travel between like, you know, London and Paris faster than like you could ride on a horse, you could send a guy, right? And so then we invented the steam engine. And then suddenly, you know, we could transact and travel at the speed of like the, uh, the train could get you there. And that basically opened up whole new areas of commerce, but it didn't fundamentally alter our entire conceptions of like what statehood is or what justice is. It just basically created a new mechanism. We created a postal service that people could do and that genuinely changed our lives but it didn't like reinvent the state, right? And I think yes. uh, a more pragmatic reading of crypto that's a lot more maybe like the postal service in its aspirations than say some massive paradigm shift. Um, and I think there's some really interesting pair, but. Yeah, I mean, I just want to riff on that. Just one thing is to say, there's this category at, that, that there's two things you mentioned here that I think go to, uh, that go really wider and deeper than crypto about what I'd call the techno, uh, solutions or the techno orientation of our society. So just to pull out point one is people extrapolate technology, sometimes mistakenly. Um, you know, airplanes were getting faster and faster. People thought we'd all be riding around like supersonic jumbo jets now. We're not. Um, there are, you know, light bulbs have got a lot more efficient, but there's like a physical limit to their efficiency um, that we're going to hit. Um, there's, there's many things, there's a tendency because of the kind of digital technology, it's the rapidity of its advance to imagine that, that, it, that, it, that things will just kind of keep going or things that we can imagine will become real. And that's one problem is when is that extrapolation justified and when is it, when is it not? You know, oh, maybe it's like, you know, people say, oh, well, like, you know, cars used to look like Henry Ford's and now we have cars today or, you know, 20 years ago, you know, social media, social networks were really basic and now we have Facebook. But the thing is, it, and you could say, oh, but algorithmic stable coins are really basic now and they will be like the equivalent of Facebook in 20 years. And that's a difficult, that doesn't always happen. So that's potential pitfall number one. And then pitfall number two is what I'd call a category error, which is technology clearly alters our lives, you know, from inventing, you know, stone tools to writing to the internet. Uh, the question, though, is what types of things does it alter over what time periods in what way? What, and I think that was your point about, yes, clearly having a steam based postal service or even email makes a massive difference, but it doesn't necessarily suddenly the state just disappears or whole new realms of governance come into being that didn't before. And so um, that's a really important point. Again, we don't have time to delve into this. It would come up as we examine these things in subsequent episodes. But that category error point, how do we determine when something is going to, you know, when technology really is going to change the possibility space or make things new things possible? And when is it not? Is actually really important because there's a tendency to imagine that technology is this kind of magic pixie dust that any hard problem that we come across will kind of throw some pixie dust on it and it will dissolve away. And that's not a, at all clear that's the case. Um, and I think there's also another part of the critique then, and I might be seeing your words here just to come back, which is, not only might things not work, but it might go badly wrong. Um, when we, you know, there's a reason we limit, for example, biomedical experimentation. I mean, obviously this debate over the source of COVID, but just more generally, even though there might be benefits, we're also quite cautious about what biomedical experimentation we do because things could go, we could release some kind of deadly virus or a genetic mutation that just takes off in some way. Similarly, when we play around with the financial system, or we play around with other complex systems that we have in our society, um, there's 
things could go kind of great sometimes, but they could also go really badly. We could have, you know, financial crashes, uh, panics. We could, uh, you know, uh, empower groups. I mean, even this is the case in, in self-organizing. There's really, there's the Linux kernel. There's also QAnon. Um, self-organizing groups on the internet do both wonderful things and not so wonderful things potentially. So we want to think about those kind of consequences. Um, so to come maybe to the second point of the critique, um, this, there's this aspect that crypto is the smartest people in the world exiting into their own economy or, you know, one, one version of it goes a bit like that. Even let's leaving aside almost that just to start with the kind of plutocratic or elitist element of that, which people might have, let's just start like, even if they did, and, and you're one of those people, you know, you, you're exiting into your own economy surrounded by other brilliant, probably mostly male uh, minds. Uh, <laughs> what, you know, there's these questions like, who's going to fill the, you know, it's your, okay, it's all in this, like, we're all in cyberspace, but who's going to fill, you know, who's going to fix the potholes? Um, why will they fix the potholes? You know, uh, who will run the medical services? Uh, who will, who will provide? You know, who, who will cook the food? Uh, you know, uh, what? How's that going to work? Do you want to say a bit more about that, Stephen? About this kind of question? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the fundamental question, like, who's going to fix the potholes? Why are they going to fix the potholes? Is a proxy question for like the most profound question in like political science. Like, why do we? Why do we? How do we sustain public goods and how do we basically create an economy in the state that works? And I think the, the best commentary on um, this problem was actually given in a uh, in an American cartoon called South Park, actually, in which there's this this kid. Um, it's a bit sophomoric the episode, but basically he wants to run a theme park, and right and then suddenly he realizes that like oh if the ride breaks down, then I'm basically going to have to hire somebody to fix it. And then if I hire somebody to fix it, then I have to pay their salary. And if I hire somebody to basically, you know, bring in customers to pay the salary of the person who's going to fix the ride, then I have to basically provide food service. And then if I have food service, I need to provide bathrooms. Then I need to basically need to provide, you know, like ticketing and provide a pension fund for my employees. And so you basically re end up recreating exactly the same kind of structures that exist inevitably because humans have needs uh, and they need to have these kind of command and control structures. And those arise naturally out of the fact that, you know, an economy exists, people need to trade, they need to have their needs met. And so like, who is going to fix the potholes in sort of the nations of the utopia? Because like the lived experience of your average person is not your average, you know, VC partner or your average like FX trader. It's more like, you know, the person in Thailand who makes a living selling, you know, chicken, right? Um, what does this kind of nation state actually offer them? Because that's the bulk of humanity. Yeah, and, and, and I think it's even more than that. I mean, it relates to some of these views about DAOs, which what you're, you're, what you're, you're also arguing is, and, and this again is going to require us other episodes or research in, in our project, but it's to say uh, what the Cartman land point is as you start to create governance, you know, as we start to organize groups, whether you do it within the state or not, they end up looking like the state. If they scale to anything near like state scales, all the things that people don't like about the state sort of come back. Now, I want to say for my part, I think there are, I'm not saying solutions, there are ways out of this conundrum. We're not always stuck. We can scale because we have scaled in human history. We have scaled democracy and trust. We have got in many places more egalitarian. We have managed to solve public goods problems. But a lot of those things have, by the way, involved innovation, not in technology, but I would call it in being, uh, innovate, ontological innovation. Um, uh, like in, in, for example, just changing who we see as like ourselves, you know, our relationship with them uh, through religion and other processes. But the thing is just here to say it's, it's quite deep. And at a crude level, if we were just imagining like techno utopia where all the crypto, we, we've just kind of exited to our own state, a lot of the, the dysfunctionality we see that people critique will still be there because we won't really underlie the root cause. It's kind of, it, it's a function of organizing at scale. Um, to go into this, we'd have to go into more detail. And on the other side, what we'd say is, which we haven't seen yet, I have to say, in my experience yet, uh, in the Web3 and crypto side of things, is a detailed explanation of how those problems, why Cartman land won't happen. Why will 
why will we it, it's kind of a bit like the, and it's the analogy of Morrison is very apt here like there's a beautiful aspiration you know we do want a world without alienation exploitation where where everyone's sort of kind of everyone else is equal where we work on what we want to work on and somehow dinner still gets made and cars still get manufactured uh, but it turned out that, that just didn't happen by default what, what happened was that actually just power resurfaced in uh, in actually almost more dysfunctional less free more command and control and exploitative ways and quick Crypto really has the kind of crypto web three three system really has to provide detail why this isn't just like the marks it's like oh the dream sounds amazing but actually when we try and like manufacture steel but we now don't have free markets well we're going to have the gulag or we're going to have like you know command and control you have to work here or you don't have a choice kind of aspect of things um so that that that's i think the detail of this point and again i think the onus here is on the the kind of the advocates for this to spell out in some detail how that would happen or to point to actual concrete examples even now at school scale where DAOs are somehow more efficient or more functional as collective groups um and again we want to emphasize or i at least want to emphasize the the the, the shared aspiration isn't that a wonderful dream that's what we all want is a freer fairer more egalitarian yet more innovative world the question is how do we get there? And is this root of technology, is it the root or even enabled by technology in this way of crypto and Web3 relevant at all? Um, and does it provide also risks? Because as we said, the other thing is, even if it worked, there's a, <laughs> it's a danger that at least as described, uh, you know, in this vision, which is a quote, crypto is the smartest people in the world exiting into their own economy. It sounds like a tech-led plutocracy, not a utopia. Um, so it, how does it not, you know, become wildly unequal in various ways. Uh, so the next point I think we also have to hear is the state, because often a lot of this is almost semi-anarchist or semi-libertarian. The state does exist for a good reason, at least the current state. And it's a result of thousands of years of trial and error. Um, it's the only structure that has proven to sustain public goods at a civilization level and to be a guarantor of last resort for justice, defense, monetary in issuance. Um, Property right, you know, and we can go to a list here, maybe Steve, you, you, what we can just talk it through, you know, to go back to the points which were made in the previous section, Steel Manning argument, where it's like, oh, crypto can do property rights or whatever. Let's just go through some of those points. I mean, uh, property rights over physical goods are not enforceable with cryptography at the moment. Um, again, it's maybe someday that everything will be tied to the blockchain. Um, it's also not even clear that property rights over digital stuff is enforceable with cryptography. After all, to actually use any piece of information, you have to unencrypt it. This is, as people have found with DRM for the last 20 or 30 years, it's very difficult to digitally lock something up in a way that gives that you want people to use it, but isn't unlockable and then shareable. So it's not even really clear how crypto without some mechanism that beyond it. So one of the funny things about DRM and technological protection measures for copyright material was it always required enforcement by the state of the copyright rules or the laws to not make this tooling um so crypto has has got some fundamental limits on property rights enforcement without some kind of physical world analog of you know the courts the police etc we which it seems we still need. And in fact, in certain parts of the crypto DAO ecosystem, they're busy reinventing kind of courts and appeal procedures and arbitration all over again. Um, then there's things maybe, Steve, you could talk about like the central bank and we talked about in previous episodes. I mean, you're getting to a really good set of points is that like fundamentally, um, the state exists for a very good reason because it does these services very, very well, or at least to a level that like, you know, civilization can exist. And um, the central bank is one of those things that like, obviously, you know, the Euro, the dollar, these are very relatively stable currencies that sustain, you know, quadrillions of dollars in private debt. You know, the entire world denominates its, you know, transactions in dollars. It's the most successful financial product of all time. Um, these things work on a profound level and they enable prosperity and global commerce in ways we've never even seen throughout human history. So to say that we need to replace the most successful financial project in human history with some sort of thing that doesn't even exist yet is an absurdist proposition. And then it's just the notion that like dispute resolution, which has been one of the primary functions of the state, um, you know, 
people are going to have disagreements. And in civilized society, we don't fight each other with like guns and knives. We fight with words, right? We go to a magistrate, you hear an argument, and then we fight with the argument and reason and logic, right? And this is a great engine for prosperity and peace in our societies. Uh, it's unclear that you can replace any of that capacity with code and the notion that like smart contracts or so-called smart contracts can function as like the same function as you know arbitration over property rights or you know can adjudicate matters of like justice is um a priori kind of absurd except in extreme cases where you're only dealing with like digital goods which is not the vast majority of cases that exist in the world today. We still need magistrates and courts. We still need to interpret the law in the minds of other humans and have justice be delivered yeah. by a jury of your peers, right? Yeah, I mean, it's just this point, which is that smart contracts are mostly dumb contracts and not in a critic, not in a judgmental way, but most of the things that you can that you can write down are not what get disputed in courts. If it was clearly written in the contract, it normally doesn't go to litigate. You have courts for this interpretation for all of the subtlety and complexity that arises, the use cases you didn't think of when you wrote the contract. This is what all these systems exist for and, and help deal with, uh, along with enforcement. And it, the enforcement is just kind of this minor point, and I think that's that's sort of sometimes missed. Uh, that, you know, again, there's a whole topic of economics in complete contracts. And then there's the public goods problem, which is really dear to my heart, and I'm sure we will dedicate an episode to. There's often discussion in Web3 circles, uh, quite a lot of it, about public goods problems, uh, including funding, software, and other things. But it's not at all clear um, how they solve the free rider problem. How, you know, uh, there's just, as far as I can tell, I haven't found yet an actual substantive explanation of how this would happen, how you deal with contribution, how do you make sure that everyone contributes to the public good that you need? Uh, how do you make sure that people contribute to defence or education or R&D in your DAO, your society? Um, you know, or, or, and if people choose to not participate, how do you stop them having access to the goods? Um, I mean, I, I mean, and perhaps on the far end of these, and we again I could dedicate an episode to it. There seems to be claims about universal basic income and DAOs, like almost every utopian idea, often again, hugely admirable of a universal basic income, kind of get thrown into the pot here without any explanation. I mean, I was on an episode where people were talking to me about a DAO based UBI project. And when I said, well, how many people are actually getting funded at like $400 a month? And you're talking like, a few hundred or a few thousand. There's just no sense of how UBI would scale to the level of a society. But again, there's this kind of like, well, don't you realize it may look small now, but Facebook looks small and one day it will be this. And this comes back to this discussion of, we have to be quite rigorous about what things, you know, like again, going to the Marxists, you know, what things actually extrapolate. Um, what, when we do X, will it really be the case that suddenly we can do UBI at scale? Um, and just because it's, to kind of move us on, um, you, you've mentioned here, like to talk a little bit about the perspective on Web3 as this kind of embodiment of pervasive individualism. Yeah, I think there's this uh, political theorist named McPherson that kind of gave what I consider kind of like the clearest distillation of kind of the sort of aspirations of the, the Web3 movement. It's called possessive individualism. It's kind of a philosophy in which an individual is conceived of as the sole proprietor of his or her skills and owes nothing to society for them. These skills are a commodity to be bought and sold on the open market. And in such a society uh, is demonstrated as a selfish and unending thirst for consumption, which is considered the crucial core of human nature. Um, so this is the kind of essence is that like we're all kind of going to act as sole proprietors, uh, you know, transnational nomads that kind of just go around selling our services on the, the global community of city states in which we exchange our time and our goods for, you know, some notion of home and community. And we're just going to basically everything is exchangeable. Everything is fungible. We're all just commodities in the global economy. Right. Um, and I think the most salient critique of this comes from a kind of classic economics problem, which is called um, Ronald Coase's theory of the firm. Maybe Rufus, you want to cover what that essence of that argument is? Well, I just say on this call, because I think I, 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 we, we might mention it here. We're getting to our time on the call. I, what I want to say, because I want to say two things about that. So I think that, um, that point also represents almost the epitome of modern, I'd say the ideology in a reduced version, because I wasn't of like modern 
rational economic man or woman and you know that they they, they, they that, that thirst as you said that their self unending thirst for consumption is kind of the crucial core of human nature and that's a cool point to end on is this is an ontological vision that, that at least in this very mm-hmm. utopian part of its problem just like Marx was wrong at the ontological level, his kind of assumption, not maybe explicitly stated, was if we got rid of the private, the exploitation of, of, of you know, and the inequality and the, the private property, we would just all kind of be nice to each other, that these issues of competition or of politics of power wouldn't resurface. And that kind of, that there's something deeper that needs to transform in human nature for that to actually be the case. Uh, you know, a society of like Zen masters or mistresses might work in that way, but a society of normal people hasn't so far. And just as that vision, you know, ignores the cultural embeddedness, just to go to that point, like we are, we are, we do owe things. We, we know one of us, we interbe with all of our ancestors, with our society, with our culture. You know, there's no, I, there's no single idea I, Rufus, have ever come up with. They are always, I've built, must have, just by kind of just the nature of reality in my mind's existence on all the ideas of others. Um, you know, similarly, as you say, there's, there's this kind of critiques from the theory of the firm we'll come to. But simply to say, we want to end this episode, I think, at this moment. So, but that's one of the most profound points, which is that this ontological assumption of possessive individualism and how we could imagine this world of kind of uh, network states it sounds it, it doesn't sound at all realistic and it doesn't sound uh, very attractive from an ontological perspective about the nature of human beings um and i don't think it's perhaps accidental but both rational economics and kind of even some of quite a lot of modernity comes from the 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 slightly autistic end of the spectrum sometimes and i say that as, as someone who is autistic um so i want to end on this point is to say that as it as put is actually a rather bleak dystopian vision of the future um it's neil serbison's stevenson's burb claims you know we can't run nation states like tech startups they're not the same thing and they would be uh deeply troubling if we if we tried on a, on a, on a very kind of deep level it would be troubling in the way that we related to each other more significantly this is just a huge explanatory gap in the story there's a wonderful vision much like Marx there's a valid critique and there's there's a very pr- important a crucial gap in explanation how even if the these network states were desirable in the form which they may, might not be even if they were how does crypto or web3 or anything else get us there um, and how do we ensure it doesn't take us somewhere worse which is clearly always a risk in significant iteration and Basically, this sounds like a kind of technological or engineering solutionism. This is a quick fix in technology, uh, you know, for, for deep, wicked problems in governance and collaboration and in human relationships and behavior. Uh, there, is, there is wisdom in learning from the past institutions that exist. Um, and to finish, I think, Stephen, you know, there, there are many utopian experiments that, that are admirable, though, have also failed. Now, if like me, and Stephen might be more of a more of a Burkean conservative, but for me at least, I am a radical utopian, but I'm also a very pragmatic one. And I want my past to be to the future to be well thought through, uh, psychologically considered, and not techno solutionist, because I think that provides the best hope for actual success and actual progress for humanity rather than uh, the many bad outcomes that have been documented too often, all too often in human history when we go wrong anything you'd like to add before we start off today Stephen? no i think that's a really great conclusion i have a very similar view and i think there's a kind of apt comparison to um like constructed languages so there's this language called esperanto which in the middle of the 20th century was conceived of to be this kind of uh, ideal form of communication uh which was basically a constructed language it doesn't uh, evolve from like you know historical languages, but it was constructed from first principles to have perfect grammar and perfect structure, and that we'd be able to conceive more pure thoughts inside of Esperanto, and this would bring about peace throughout the world. Um, And to me, a lot of techno-solutionism feels like Esperanto. Basically, it's trying to create the ideal form of something detached from the reality of the thing as it is. And I fundamentally think that like financial systems are fundamentally organic things that evolve out of the base human needs 
and that trying to create a financial system from first principles is exactly like trying to create like a constructed language from first principles and trying to impose that on the world. It just doesn't work in practice. It's a beautiful idea, but you know the reality is um, there's a lot of wisdom in things that have been built and from the mistakes of the past that have been folded into our current institutions and our current thinking. And we ignore those at our own peril. And utopianism you know, has a very bad track record. There's a little wonderful book called uh, The Utopians by this uh, author named Anna Nema. And she outlines how this this very, very seductive idea that you know captures absolutely brilliant thinkers throughout history has led to a lot of disasters and a lot of communities that have either been basically dissolved because of the Cartman land argument, or they basically just collapse because they're based on unsound ideas and they're not able to incorporate into community and the world as a whole. And this to me strikes up all the hallmarks that we've seen from the kind of you know, false utopian visions of the past, but kind of sprinkled with a bunch of techno obscurantism and massive gaping economic holes in the argument. And that to me seems like the biggest critique of this viewpoint is that it has too many open questions um, and fundamentally the ideology seems to be based on some presuppositions that don't seem sound. Yeah. Well, so if you'd like to follow more, uh, we are launching this now as a full project. You can find it at web3.lifeitself.us. Uh, we'll be releasing future episodes. You can sign up there for them. Uh, that's it this for, all for this week from myself, Rufus Pollock uh, at Life Itself and Stephen Deal, my, my, co, my uh, co-initiator here. Uh, thank you very much and tune in next time. All the best till then. Take care.